I got inspired uh, by our study uh, last Sunday night and then some things that I had been looking at throughout the week. I got inspired uh, this week, I think, in Indiana. I'm going to be talking about how people, I think I mentioned this this morning, but how people get wrapped up in false doctrine, how, they, how that happens to them. By the way, how's Chris? Chris is doing very well. Good. Wow. That bionic knee he's got. He'll be able to, he'll be able to kick doors in. He'll be working for the CIA for too long. That's how it works. You know, the government puts it in. Well, they'll want it back, you know, so. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, but anyway, um, maybe Tuesday night while I'm in Indiana, I'll teach that. And uh, then I'll maybe come back and kind of go over it here. But it really, really made sense to me once I was looking in the scriptures about the heart of man and what he believes in his head versus what he believes in his heart. And really, uh, if you believe something with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your might, I think those three things are connected together. Um, then it's just hard to get that out of somebody. We, who are believers in the truth, and I believe that, we have this in our heart. There are other people who have their religion in their heart, but it's for a different reason, and there is a different spirit attached to it. And it is very, very difficult to get them to change their heart. People change their mind all the time. But to change a person's heart takes an act of God. And... Um, so anyway, I'd, I've been studying that, and I kind of studied that throughout the week. And some of it came out uh, during Pastor Mike Online, but I've really got it put together, I think, for teaching this week. So pray for us uh, while we are in Delphi, and uh, pray for the meetings, and pray that God will bless. Uh, I had somebody call today, and they wanted information on the meeting. They wanted to know... If there was a flyer made up, and I said, yeah, a guy's run an ad, and he has a flyer of that ad. And she said, well, would it be okay if I posted that on Facebook and invited us? Yes, absolutely. Bring, bring whoever you want to. So I just hope we have enough food for everybody. But I think we do. But anyway, uh, let's uh, pick it up. Let's go to Ephesians uh, chapter 6 for tonight. Uh, we're going to uh, get into the principalities and so on. We talked a little bit about that last Sunday night. In fact, a lot about it. And I'm going to kind of pick it up um, from there and look at more closely at principalities, how they work, what they do, and so on. We saw from the scriptures last week that a prince, the word principalities, speaks of princes, and there are princes in the Bible. Um, the prince of devils in Matthew chapter 9, what they accuse Jesus of. In Matthew 9 and Matthew 12, they accuse Jesus of casting out devils by the prince of devils, by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Uh, John 12, 31 talks about the prince of this world being cast out. John 14, 30, uh, for the, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Um, hold your place there in Ephesians 5 and turn to Revelation uh, chapter 9. There is a, um, an evil band of devils that have been cast into prison. And Jude says it. They've been cast into prison. And I believe Revelation 9 is them being let out of prison. And the description of them is, it initially describes them as locusts, but then it says they have the tails of scorpions. And it says in verse 7 of Revelation 9, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, 
and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. They had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. There were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And in verse 11 says that they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So even these very evil, these things are so evil that God did not, for their sin, God did not banish them to earth. He put them in chains of darkness and put them down in the pit, held them there to not let them out. But at this point, the sounding of the fifth trumpet, God allows them to be let out. An angel, a star falls from heaven, but to that angel was given the key of the bottomless pit, and Jesus knew what that angel was going to do with it. I've got the key, should I open it? Oh, absolutely, that's what he was made for. So he opens it, but even these evil beast devils that are flying up out of this pit, they have a king over them, and that king leads them, he guides them, he tells them what to do. Um, similar to the way certain animals communicate with others, lions, there's always a king, there's always a, in a den of lions, there's always a king lion, and he communicates in various ways what he wants uh, from his, uh, from his uh, pride of lions there. He tells them what to do. The insect world, there be queens over bees. And the, the, bee, the queen bee is very protected, but she is the one that controls the hive and so on. And so we have, a, we have a principality in that we have a king that reigns over these devils and he controls them and tells them what to do. So then, um, Ephesians 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children to disobedience. So... The thought is, any place you have disobedience to God's word, there is a principality who governs that person. They do according to its will, but not their own will. They will do what they are led to do, what they are inspired to do, and so on. Now, Ephesians 6, we've gone over this many, many times. Verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And so wherever there is biblical authority, there is going to be, I believe, a band of devils that that seek to destroy that area of authority. God blesses authority. God is in earthly authority. Um, Cubby, are there bad cops out there? Okay. But if they pop the siren on and pull you over, the badge that they wear gives them the authority to detain you to inform you that you violated the law and to enforce the law. That's his authority. Now, if he steps out of that authority, then he can be in trouble. There are ways to deal with that in a nation of laws. And we still need to be a nation of laws. Amen? I am not an anarchist in any way. I do not believe that a person governs themselves. That's not wise. People need to be ruled. Now, people are ruled badly in many places of the world, and I understand that. But still, there has to be, or, there has to be ordained authority. There has to be an enforcement of rules. We have to be people of laws, and we have to keep those laws. Uh, if we don't like the laws that we have, we change our government through our voting, and hopefully we get in. I think we've got a decent, 
Supreme Court justice now. I think this man is a constitutionalist, and I think he is going to follow the law. That's what I want. It's what I hope for, is for, for the Supreme Court to not make law, but to follow the law and follow the Constitution. That's all we're asking. And so it, our nation is ruled by laws. The supreme law of the land is not the president, it's not the Congress, it's not the Supreme Court, it is the Constitution. That is the highest authority. When they swear the oath of office, they are swearing to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Not, he's not, the president's not promising to, to protect the Congress or his own office or the Supreme Court or all three together. He is swearing to defend the Constitution. That's our highest law. Uh, our Bible is the highest law. It is what rules our church. It should rule our homes. It should rule our land. At one time it did. Now it's questionable. But anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's have God lead us. Father, pray God that you would lead us now as we study your word, give us wisdom and give us insight. Father, there is, there's many, many battles to fight. And I pray, God, that you would just give us wisdom uh, to know, Lord, when to stand. And, Father, give us the power to stand. Help us to stand on your word and stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Father, we are a free people. We do not wish to be entangled in the yoke of bondage ever again. And, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would protect your laws Protect the laws of the state of Missouri. Protect the laws of the United States of America. And God, I pray, Lord, that the bad laws would be taken away, done away with. Good laws would reign supreme. Father, just bless us and give us wisdom according to your word. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Now, last week we went through this very quickly. Uh, areas of principalities. The Vatican has principalities. It has devils that rules over those people there. That's why they believe what they believe. I believe that Pope really believes the church that he is a part of. He really believes it because that's what's in his heart. But he has an abundance of idols in his heart. And that's why he does not understand the power and the wisdom that's in the written word of God. Uh, which that's, we talked about that. That's the obelisk that represents a, a devil, the Antichrist. Here's Washington, D.C. There is a goddess ruling over the capital of the United States. Lincoln's Memorial is a temple, a pagan temple of Zeus. Uh, the, uh, there is the obelisk again, Washington's Monument. There's multiple symbols here. Symbols represent deities of different kinds. Now, let's talk about a church. Are there... Governing offices in a church. Does a church have a person who is in authority in that church? The answer is yes. It is the pastor. It is not a board of people. Uh, it, is, it is not necessarily, even though I believe that God's people have a voice. And um, our board does things differently than how the church did it at, when I was growing up. Uh, we had a lot of business meetings, a lot of board meetings, and um, voting over, in some cases, tr very trifle things. And uh, it led to a lot of uh, people despising one another because their opinions were made known and so on, and, and just different things. I saw this church split uh, back in 1979. It was one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. And I never wanted that to happen again here. And so I just do things differently. Uh, I love this church as much as anybody else does. Never want to do it any harm. And um, I respect the voice of the people. And I respect the men that are on the board that helps, uh, that helps me make decisions. The Bible says in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. And so I don't. I, I am definitely not one that thinks that it's my way or the highway, uh, that every, everything has to be approved by me, and uh, I'm the total leader and controller of everything. 
Uh, there have been situations where I asked the board uh, to make uh, their choice and that I would go along with that. And God has always blessed that. But in the scriptures, Hebrews chapter 13, turn there. Underline this in your Bible. God has areas of authority. Let me just kind of give you a little background of why I think this is important. I've heard stories told of a lot of churches. You get around pastors and they tell you what they know and what they hear. I know of one church in northwest Arkansas, the church itself, and when I say the church, I don't just mean the church building, I mean the whole church is owned by one person. That man owns the lot, he owns the building, and he owns the church, period. And that church has a reputation of it will bring in young pastors and when those preachers, at first, the, the preacher will feel like he's got liberty to say what he wants to say and to preach what he wants to preach. But after a while, he gets on the wrong people, says the wrong thing, and that man runs them out. And I have a pastor friend that got called into that church and he was warned by people who knew what was going on. They said, be careful. If you take that church, that's between you and God. But I'm warning you, don't take the stuff out of your boxes. If you move up there, don't unpack everything. And so he went up there thinking he could make a difference. But because of this one man in the church, he preached something that that man didn't like and he put him out because he owned he would collect the offering and that was his money maker he, he would profit off of what was going on in that church and people that just i guess they just felt they've met family members or whatever i don't know but that's 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 not right that's out of order and anybody who would try to establish order in that church, they'd be run out because that guy pretty much owns everything. I've told you the church out in South Carolina where there was a wealthy man in that church, owned several businesses around, and he was, he was not on any board of that church, but he had friends and family members that were just about on every board in that church. And he had power behind the scenes. What the pastor that I know found out that through his businesses, he was laundering money through the church so as to not pay taxes on it. He would write a check for $100,000 January 1st, and that would be deposited in an account, and he would make withdrawals throughout the year. Now, he justified it by saying that he would deposit that money in the church account, and whenever someone couldn't pay for their medicine, he would give it away, but then he would pay himself out of that church fund, tax-free. And the pastor called two different law offices and they said, he's funneling money, he's laundering money through the church, you need to put a stop to that or they'll come after you, you're the pastor. And when he tried to put a stop to it, they had a meeting and they run the pastor out. That's unbiblical, that's not right. There was a church in Arkansas. Well, I don't know why all of these churches are in Arkansas, but anyway, there was a church in Arkansas. I preached at this church. I preached on the King James Bible, and the pastor was pro King James, but they had NIV pew Bibles everywhere, and he was doing things on Sunday night on, on the King James Version issue. The deacons decided they had had enough of that. They called in a deacons meeting, called and woke up seventeen deacons. Guys that had been there since 1942. And they woke them up, drug them over to this deacons meeting. 17 deacons in this church of about 110 people. And they all voted without the pastor being present. They had a private meeting. Without the pastor being present, they voted to say that they were going to tell the preacher to stop preaching on the King James issue. They were not buying new pew Bibles. And if he didn't stop, they were going to fire him and find him another pastor. That also is unbiblical. It's not right. 
And there's story after story after story of where boards, deacon boards, trustee boards, general boards, whatever, had more power and authority than the head of the church, which is the pastor. And it's almost like over the years, there's always been, I, I knew a pastor that when somebody brought it to his attention, there were no deacons in the church. He said, deacons are nothing but trouble. We ain't getting deacons in this church. That also is unbiblical. And so in a lot of churches, there exists this thing where there is, it's always like it's the pastor versus the board. And I mean, there, like I say, Brother Reg Kelly, when he was pastor there at Liberty Faith years ago, he started a Christian school. Well, that opened up a can of worms with a lot of people because they had family members that were working in the school and the school district gets so much money per pupil that is enrolled in that school. And what he did was he pulled about 30 or 40 kids out of the school when he opened up a Christian school. Well, that didn't sit well with some people. So behind the scenes, they said, we're going to try to shut this thing down. So he found out they were going to have a board meeting and they were going to pass a, a thing, a rule that said any expenditure over $25 had to have board approval. It's hard to buy a box of staples for less than $25. And what that was, it was an effort to shut it down. And Brother Edge tells the story better than I do, but he said... He prayed about it. He went into the meeting. He did not have a bad spirit. He sat down with those men and they prayed. And then he said, guys, before you start this, he said, I'm going to ask you a question. If you can show me in the Bible where a board runs the church, I will willingly submit to it. And he was very sincere in it. And he said, you could have heard a pin drop. And, you know, guys were clearing their throat. And he said, just around that room, he could see the men, the faces of the men looking down. And one of the men said, I don't even see in the Bible where there is to be a board. And so they prayed. And I, I know that they didn't pass that particular rule. But it was, it was an issue over who has the power, who has control. And any time that's going on, that is a principality spirit that seeks to take control, seeks to, to remove biblical authority. Okay? So, Hebrews 13, 17. The Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you. Now let me stop right here. Where does that apply? It doesn't specify. It does not specify, meaning that in any area of life where there is a boss, a manager, a agent, a president, a pastor, a governor, a principal, or whatever. In every area of life, there is someone who has rule over people. Now, yes, there are exceptions to those rules. If someone in authority demands, commands you to do something that goes against God's authority, then man's authority is to not be obeyed. That's, and it's very simple. But the reason why I asked Cubby, are there bad cops? Just because you might be a better person morally than a police officer who pulled you over, it does not mean that you do not have to come under his rule and his authority. It does not mean that. You don't ask him, are you born again? Or are you saved? Because if you're not, I'm not listening to you. I would not recommend that at a traffic stop. 
Okay? The Bible says obey them. What, what, are, what are the police for? Well, they enforce laws. But they, where authority is, is protection. Whenever there is a man shooting out of the windows of his house at people walking, driving up and down the street, it's not the firemen that go there. Okay? And it's not the city council who shows up. It's the police. They're there to protect the citizens. Even at the risk of their own life, they're there to protect them. And we are to obey them so long as they do not ask us to violate God's authority. Okay? Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls. There's the protection part right there. They watch for your souls. They provide protection. As they that must give account. Because everybody who is in authority will stand before God and give an account of how they ruled. Amen? Whether they, whether they're, they themselves are breaking the law and getting away with it, and you know about it, and nothing seems to be done, I promise you this Bible says they're going to stand before God and give an account of how they ruled. And if they ruled unjustly, God is going to get them. He's going to get them eternally. They're going to pay in hell or in the lake of fire for eternity. They're going to pay for that. They're not going to get away with it. Okay? I have zero doubt that Bill Clinton is one of the dirtiest, scuzziest politicians. Him and Hillary both are in it together. They're some of the sleaziest behind-the-scenes workers that ever walked into Washington, D.C. And when he was... When he was um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, the head is trial. When he was impeached, they found him not guilty, but he was guilty. And everybody knew it. They knew it. So he got away with it, but he's not going to get away with it. He's going to stand before a greater authority and give an account for it. And when somebody is in authority, and you don't like what they're doing, do you see anything here that says you can rebel against that and... Do whatever you want. Let God have it. God knows every unjust judge in the world. He knows every crooked politician. He knows every dirty cop. And he is the just judge of the actions and the activities of mankind. Always. Vengeance belongeth to the Lord. Okay? For they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. So if your boss is constantly having to deal with unruly workers, he's always going to be in a bad mood. He's going to be in a terrible way and you're going to hate going to work there. If he's always in a bad mood because he has to deal with everybody, you could not, you, there ain't enough money in the world for me to be a manager of a McDonald's restaurant, I can tell you that. There is not enough funds in the universe for me to be a manager at McDonald's. Because they hire everybody. They hire everybody. Everybody that needs a job can go to McDonald's and get a job. And some people just don't want to work. Okay? So there has to be somebody in charge, somebody who is ruling over that. And all it takes is a camera. We were, in, we were coming up out of the south one time. We was in Mississippi somewhere, and we stopped at a McDonald's, and it was filthy. I mean, the bathroom was filthy. The eating area was filthy. The trash cans were full. There was, there was soda junk laying everywhere. And... All these people, all these workers standing around doing nothing. I pulled my phone out and I started taking pictures of the whole place. And I heard somebody going, he's taking pictures. You never saw people get up and work faster. 
I mean, they went to it. They started cleaning everything. They knew it. They thought I was going to write a letter, and I almost did. But anyway, obey them that have rule over you. And this particularly is, is in application to the church. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. It is my responsibility to make sure that this church is being steered correctly according to the will of God. That is my responsibility. It is a heavy responsibility if it's not right. That's, and when I talked about spending three days in my office fasting and praying, it's because things were not right and I knew it. And I didn't know what to do. And I was waiting for God to tell me what to do. I was literally waiting for God to show me what to do. And I had told God that I was not going to quit fasting. and I was going to keep wrestling with him. He was not going to get me to shut up until he told me what to do and showed me how things would be done. And it was right after that, we closed our Christian school down. We closed our daycare down. It was obvious to me that those were not no longer in the will of God. And then I'm going, okay, I'm free from that. What am I going to do with the rest of my time? And two weeks later, God gave me the watch and broadcast. Boom. Okay, now we're flying. And God move, God has been moving ever since in that situation. But it's, I, it's my responsibility to make sure that I'm in the Word and that I know what the Bible says so I can teach it correctly to you so that I am watching over your soul. I'm responsible for your soul. If I'm preaching damnable heresies and you believe them, you're damned, but I'm damned for teaching them. Okay? And that's a, that's a heavy, heavy thing with me. I do not want to teach something that is not true. I know I'm a man, and I know I'm not always going to be right on everything. This is why we have the Bible and uphold the Bible in the way that we do. The meeting that we had in deciding to elect John as a deacon. I saw, I saw the Bible come out in that meeting. I absolutely did. The decision that was made in that meeting room was 100% biblically made. And I was, I was amazed. I was just going... I, I'm not going to tell you what all was said in there, but there were some guys in that room that absolutely floored me with wisdom from the Bible. I just, I'm just going. It was, it was awesome. But you had, we have men who are submitted to the Lord, who know the Bible. It's not their first day in church. And they all have opinions. It is my responsibility to hear them. If you look in your Bible, every ruler in the Bible has counselors. In, this, in the book of Esther, King Ahasuerus, he's king. He's got divine rule. He's got authority. He can speak the word and somebody get their head cut off. He's got that kind of authority. But he's got people that counsel him. And when he's receiving bad counsel like he got from Haman... The Bible, you know, the Bible says the city was perplexed. The whole city, there was something wrong in the entire city. Because the king was receiving bad judgment. But when Esther counseled him and showed him the truth, you know what the Bible says? The city was joyful. The whole city was full of joy. Just because the king had received godly counsel. And I'm just saying to you, it works that way. Okay? When the devil's in charge, the devils just take over everybody. When God's in charge, the Holy Ghost just takes over everybody. Everybody's just happy. Okay? Huh? It's peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. When Jesus rules, there's just peace everywhere. Okay? So obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. When I'm grieving over things in this church, I'm not studying. And when I'm not studying and learning things and giving out new things, then the city's perplexed. Okay? But when God's in charge and everybody's happy and everybody's getting along, 
There's joy here because God's showing me things. And I'm giving them to y'all and y'all are going, oh, that's great. Woo, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Boy, that's a good message, Pastor Mike. I appreciate that. And that's just because the Holy Ghost was ruling in everybody. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Well, I did not get near as far as I thought I was going to get. But I'm just, I'm making this real. I'm making it, giving it to us to where we understand it. Understanding why I'm saying the things I'm saying. It's not, if you know me, I've, I've tried hard to make a name for myself. A reputation is a name. Um, as somebody that I'm not a dictator, I'm not, it's not, you know, I'm not one of these, it'll do, be done my way or nobody, you know, everybody's going to be, I'm going to be mean to everybody. I don't, I don't yell and scream and go off on people at a, just on a whim. And uh, so, and sometimes... I let things go probably a little bit longer than I should. That's one of my faults, but I just don't fly off the handle at people all the time. And um, I'm, I'm not about, uh, those of you who know me, you know we have operated this ministry now for nine years and don't hit everybody up every time we have a service for money. We take one, when I was a kid, we took an offering every service. And since I've been pastor, we take one offering. Sunday morning, there's your chance, give. Sunday night, Wednesday night, let's just have church, amen? Okay, so I, I tried to build myself up a reputation that I'm not about, let's get the funds coming in, let's get, let's get big money here, come on, let's get it rolling in, come on. And uh, just, uh, just build a reputation for myself. A name, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and God taught me that years ago. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul's laying it out to the, to the elders and to the pastors and bishops and so on. And he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Underline that in your Bible. You're the flock and the Holy Ghost has made me the overseer. And what does that word mean to you? Overseer. Somebody's watching. Okay, I'm watching. I'm, uh, I, the Bible teaches me to know the state of my flocks. Okay, know how things are going in people's lives. Um, without being intrusive. I'm not an intrusive person. Um, but... To seek the Lord out and know what are the needs. And if I don't know them, then seek the Lord out and ask God to let me preach it. So that people come to me and they'll say, you have no idea how you spoke to me today. Because I needed that one. If there was one message I needed, I needed that message. And I'm going, I want to say, well, I knew that. And that's why, you know, but, but that's not true. God just said, preach this. And I preached it. But he said, the Holy Ghost has made overseers of the church. And he said, their responsibility is to feed the church of God. So you're the sheep. And I'm supposed to lead you to the green pastures of the word of God. To get you good and fat. Amen. Get you good and fat and stuffed. Happy sheep. Got plenty to eat. Make lots of wool. Have lots of babies. Amen? So that we can have more sheep. Amen? So, you know, we've got quite a few little sheep joining in with us. That's all been done because they were happy sheep and they made other sheep. Okay? They said, hey, watch this guy. You need to watch this guy. He's really, got to watch this guy. So that's what they've done and that's, that's how it's happened. Anyway, feed the, feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. If you've ever been questioned about whether Christ's blood was divine blood, there it is right there. God purchased with his own blood. The first pastor, Melissa and I knew at this church, wrote a paper, a doctoral paper, 
saying that the blood is not necessary for salvation. Blood simply means death, and it's the death, not the blood. I was going to have him preach here for our homecoming back in 2004, and when I found out he published that, I said, there's no way he's preaching this pulpit, and I called Ken Goff. I'm just telling that that that's wrong. See, what he does, he even changed this passage right here. He said, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And he said, now the original Greek, the way it's framed out, it should have been better translated, which, he, which has been purchased with the blood of his own son. See, so he's added words. And he said how it was originally should have been translated. He added words to the Bible. And I went, you can't do that. That's breaking the rules. So anyway, it's, we're purchased. I don't, you do not belong to me. You are not my property. I cannot do with you as I please. You belong to God. He has purchased you with his own blood. It wasn't my blood. It was his. So I do not own you. I am merely, and it's like the manager at Walmart. He does not own all those dresses and all those guns and all that food in the groceries. He does not own that. That's not his. At the end of the day, he can't just walk through and grab tomatoes and grab lettuce and grab the best steaks and grab a nice suit, and grab a gun and take it home because it's his. He's the manager of the store. He does not own that. And if he don't manage that store right, what do you think Walmart corporate's going to say? Bye. There's a McDonald's down here needing somebody to fry cook. Okay, you go work for them. But it's not their stuff. This You don't belong to me. You belong to God. Verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Here's what I know. I know this, and I know it beyond any shadow of a doubt. Grievous wolves always want to enter in. And I... It's my job to know it. I hate that part. I hate it. But it's my job to know who the wolves are. And they are, when the Bible says they're grievous wolves, grief is related to love. Now, this guy that hit Pastor John Uter on his motorcycle, I'm not grieving over him. I'm praying for him. I'm not grieving over him. If he dies, I don't know who he is. Okay? But if it was my sister, or if it was one of you guys, and you died, I grieve over that. You grieve over what you love. And when a pastor loves the church, and he's got a wolf in there, and he's got to run the wolf out, he grieves over that. He's not happy. He don't say, well, bless God, we had us a backdoor revival here and run out 14 people. Bless God. That that's, shouldn't be a time of rejoicing. That's grief. Okay? Anyway, they will come in and not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise of your own selves. You know what he's saying here? Bad preachers are going to rise up. Bad preachers of your own selves. Shall men arise speaking perverse things. You know what that is? That's NIV verses. That's verses out of a different Bible. That's talking about sex. Or that's talking about any other thing that should not be talked about in the house of God. They will speak perverse things. And the point is to draw disciples after them. I know, I know these guys who are professional YouTubers. Their main, I'll tell you what drives a lot of the garbage that's on YouTube and Facebook. These people want people to notice them and follow them. I know it. I can just about spot it. Because nine times out of ten, they will post comments on my stuff. Pointing people to their Facebook stuff or their YouTube stuff. They want my people to go look at them. And I just, I got to where I couldn't keep up with it, so I just, I let it go. But I can spot them. I know who they are. And 
Don't follow their ways. Don't do it. Listen to me. I'm not being mean. Even you folks online, you call me pastor. I want you to listen to me. You cannot have two pastors. Cannot have two pastors. Now, some of you say, we listen to you, pastor. You're our pastor. We like to listen to Brother Reg. I know Reg. I know his ministry. I love him. He's my dear friend. I'd die for him. He'd die for me. Sometimes I'd probably want to kill him. He'd probably want to kill me every now. But we're friends. And I don't, I'm not jealous over what he does. I help him. Okay? And I'm not saying it's wrong to listen to him because he and I are very close in what we preach on. But you can only have one pastor. Pick one. Okay? And, but some of you listen to somebody that I have very serious issues with. You're going to have to choose who you're under. When you're under authority, you are under protection. God will protect you. God will put a hedge around you. Just like what Satan saw. Satan saw that hedge around Job, did he not? He saw that hedge of protection that God had built around Job. Satan knew it. and Satan wanted inside that hedge. And God would not, up till then, God was not going to let him in. When you decide on a pastor, you are under their rule, but you are under their protection. God will bless you. God will bless your family. God will bless your home. You, you'll, food will taste better. Okay? All kinds of good things happen. But pick a pastor. You cannot serve two masters. Okay? You cannot hold two simultaneous jobs. Work them both at the same time. You got to pick one. And you cannot go to two simultaneous churches. Pick a church. Pick a pastor. If you want to listen to other things, that's fine. But I'm going to warn you against most of them. Okay? Because that's not your pastor. He's not the one that's grieving over you and worried about you. Okay? Let me finish this very, very quickly. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. So what my responsibility is, is to commend you to God and to his word, this book, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So my authority is always going to be based on the book. Now, I may say something every now and then you don't agree with. That's not a big deal. But if I say God has led me to put a big statue of Mary in here. Okay, I violate it. Or if I say, I think we should add the book of Enoch to the Bible. I think that's the word of God. Then I'm obviously out of line. Okay, and you have a right. You have a right to cast off evil authority if, you're, if, you're, if he's causing you to violate God's word. You have a right to throw me out and bring somebody in. You have a right to do that. I believe that. Okay, or pray that God will do it. That way your hands don't get dirty. Okay, but as long as I'm in this book, there is one authority, one pastor over you. Okay, and I don't know what else to say about that. I, I'm not picky about rules, but I don't want you to go off learning something from somebody else, like a guy that came in here a while back, said, Pastor, there is flat. I didn't teach him that. And me and him had a little talk out here in the foyer, and I had to walk away from it because I was getting steamed. And he said, I love you. And I said, I love you too, but you're wrong. You're dead wrong. Okay? Now, I found out we've had two people since I put out stuff on, since I put a website up on Flat Earth, I've had two people call and say, take us off your list. We're not listening to him anymore. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, you don't want me to be your pastor, that's fine. Find one. Okay, but you're not going to hear me lie that way. And I won't do it, and I'm going to stand against it. So, anyway, let's stand to our feet. And what, what I'm, the point I'm saying to you is this. Principalities will always try to work against me. 
Always. Will always work outside of biblical authority. To try to take me down through some kind of immorality. To try to get my heart drawn away somewhere else after some other church or some other ministry. Or whatever it is. To try to get me to leave out of this place. Because I can tell you, nine times out of ten, when a church goes bad, it's right after a pastor transition. Right after that. They get a new pastor in, all of a sudden he's wanting to change everything in that church. And that change usually is not biblical. So, so anyway. Father, I love you. I thank you, God, for what you've given to me. I thank you, Lord, for... Um, I thank you for letting me be a pastor. And I know, God, I don't deserve it. But, Father, you've asked me to stand in your place, in this place, with these people. And to say what you say. And, God, I hope always to be faithful to that one calling. Because that's the single most important thing in this world. Is for God's man to say what God said. No more, no less. So Father, put it in my heart. Put it in the heart of the people here. That we stand together always. For the word. Which is the final authority in everything. And Father, I'm so thankful God. How I've seen you move. In the heart of these people. And your word being in them. Lord, I'm very, very thankful. For how you bless this church. And I pray God that you would continue to do that. Do it for this church's sake. And our name's sake. Our reputation. Do it Father for the people that are watching online. Lord they have been run out of every place Lord. And they found us. And we're their last hope. And Father we take that seriously. And we ask you God Lord that you would keep us going for them. Father, we pray, God, that you would just use us all for your kingdom, for your glory. One of these days, God, you're going to use your church to show forth and magnify your glory here on this earth. So, Father, I would love for you to use Bethel Church for such a thing. Help us, dear God, to be one together. Help us to love you and to love your word, to love one another. And, Father, help us all, dear God, to obey the one who's in charge over us. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You pray for us as we travel this week.